Welcome, everybody, to the Bridge Fellowship. My name is Jared. I serve as one of the pastors here. I'm so grateful that we get to share some time together. I'm going to, uh, thanks, Jake. I'm going to give you a quick uh, announcement. Uh, today, we're doing things a little bit different. Um, I'm going to talk for a little while as we open God's Word, but then at the end, we're not going to do our normal song that we normally do. I'm going to dismiss us after the sermon because outside we have what's called Group Connect. You probably saw it as you came up. We normally don't have balloons everywhere, although I feel like we should. Um, there's balloons out there. There's a bunch of tables. And so what, what's out there, just so you know, there's about 18 groups, uh, small groups that are out there available. I think we have somewhere around 30-something groups that meet regularly in homes. 18 of those have space in them. And so if you don't have a place, uh, if you don't have a small group to jump into, uh, we'd love to invite you today to jump into a group. Uh, we, we just know this. You were not meant to be alone. Uh, you're not meant to be in isolation. Uh, you were meant to be in community. And so one of the things that we try to do here is just create that environment where that can happen. Small groups are one of those things. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that towards the end. If you have your Bibles, go with me to James chapter one. Uh, we're going to finish chapter one today. How do you feel about that? Okay, good. Are you excited? Okay, okay, and never mind. Uh, we're going to finish chapter one, but what we're going to do today is we're looking at James wrapping up his thought on how we progress in trials. Uh, it was about a week and a half ago, I was hanging out with the staff, and there was a question that was posed, and I think it's a good question that sometimes you should ask, too, like just questions that make you think about life. But the question was, if you could go back, if you could go back and relive your childhood, or maybe high school, would you do it? Um, it was kind of interesting among the staff. Half said they would go back uh, and kind of do it again. I'm an emphatic no. Not a chance in the world would I go back to high school. Um, honestly, there's two, two main reasons why I wouldn't go back to childhood or high school. Number one, the stress involved for me when it came to geometry uh, was not worth it. If I'm honest, like uh, I spent so much time studying for that one exam and I've never used the word rhombus since then, right? <laughs> like it doesn't even enter in the conversation. Now, the thing about it is like, the study was good for me, the material inconsequential, right? So um, that, but then also if you go back a little bit further in my childhood, I, as an adult, I'm looking back on my childhood and I wish that I could just tell Jared as an eight-year-old, hey, quicksand is not going to be what you think it is. For some reason, now I'm not just thinking, as an eight-year-old, I thought, honestly, I thought the leading cause of death was quicksand. Based on all the shows that I watched, it was like quicksand was a deal. And so I just was constantly looking out for quicksand. Everybody in the shows that I watched would like stumble into it. They start, you know, moving and the, you can't keep moving. It gets you deeper. Like you go deep, that's how you die. So I thought the leading cause. So then sometime around middle school and high school, I don't know what America did. I must've blacked out, but we took care of quicksand y'all. It's no, it's not, it's nowhere to be found. I'm looking for it. I still can't find it. Quite honestly, I wish we'd do the same thing with cedar trees. Um, <laughs> if all of us would just take down seven to eight cedar trees a year, I think we could make some difference. So anyway, um, the thing about my child is I would go back and tell Jared, Hey, quicksand is not a big, as big of a deal as you think it is. However, as I've grown older, the issue is I don't really fall into quicksand, but I have found myself getting stuck a lot. Uh, whenever it comes to my walk with the Lord, when it comes to relationships around me, when it comes to just normal life stuff, I find myself getting stuck in certain areas where it feels like I'm moving, it feels like my legs are moving, but I'm not getting any traction. As James is wrapping up chapter one, um, what he's going to press in on us is, if you kind of remember how everything's gone, he says the very first that trials are coming, that you're going to experience suffering, you're going to experience trials, and in those trials, God is doing something. Your trials are not wasted. When God brings hardship into our lives, he's doing something. You're growing in the likeness of Christ. He's doing something. Don't dismiss it too quickly. Then he said, um, in those trials, you're going to need to ask what do you ask for? You ask for wisdom. God, would you give me wisdom that I might see whatever it is that we're going through clearly? Would you let me see um, what you're doing in the middle of this? And then last week, it's even further, so there could be trials and it could go to wisdom, but be careful because you can fall into sin. And what James uh, did for us last week is whenever we're walking through trials, whenever we're walking in this, the enemy is really ripe to try to get us to persuade us with sin, to pull us aside. The hook is in the bait. Now what he's going to do as he ends chapter one, um, I think what he's going to do is to speak to those who are in the middle of trials, who maybe you've asked for wisdom, you're still trying to process, maybe you've fallen into sin and you feel as though I'm just stuck. Like I'm, I feel like I'm moving. I feel like 
you know, my legs are moving, but I'm not going anywhere. Um, that's what I think James is going to try to do here at the end of chapter one. He wants to show us what do you do when you feel stuck? Especially, I'm going to say this real quick, especially when it comes to your walk with the Lord, especially when it comes to your interaction with the scriptures. This is for most of us where we can get stuck quickest is all of a sudden we become distant with the word of God and then we feel distant from God himself. That, that oftentimes comes together. So what do we do when we feel stuck? You ready? James chapter one, verse 19. Here's what he says. I'm just going to walk through the passage today and try to give you some, some help on how we understand it. James chapter one, verse 19. James says this, my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Let's pause just for a minute because I actually think this is really important. If you're asking the question, what do I do? Which is what we ask all the time. What do I do? Can you just tell me what to do? There's actually a little secret right here. My dear brothers and sisters, he's wanting to remind us of something. So think about this. Before James tells us what to do, he tells us who we are. I think this is important for all of us whenever we are stepping into, what do I do in the middle of feeling stuck? James is going to say, don't forget brothers and sisters. For many of us, one of the things we need to remind ourselves is how the church actually works. He is the father. He is the father of us. And then we are brothers and sisters. The church is a family. So often in our walk with Christ, we want to quickly get to what to do. And quite honestly, as red-blooded Americans, I believe the reason we love the book of James so much is because all he does is tell us what to do. He just says, here's the next command. Here's the next thing you need to do. Think about this. But you have to kind of focus in here. There's these little moments where he'll say, brothers and sisters. It's familial. I've, I've been a bit shocked even in chapter one of how often he refers to the people as brothers and sisters. So we know he's writing to believers. But it is important that we remember who we are before we get to what we're about to do right? Remember that you are a brother and a sister. Remember that you've been bought by the blood of Jesus. So before you get to action, remember identity. Okay. Here's what he goes on to say. Understand this, know this, get this in your brain. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For, the, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. You'll remember last week's sermon. Humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. All right. So feeling stuck, don't really know what to do. James gives us some really practical advice. The thing I love about James is we do know um, that James was the pastor, one of the first pastors really of a church. And so he was in charge of the church. He was leading and teaching. And one of the things that any leaders and teachers wants to do is to make quick, pithy statements that all of us will remember. And the thing that we all love, I think all of us, including myself, is, man, can you just make it simple for me? Can you help me to understand it? I need some good advice. And one of the things that we do is we go to James and we see, this is really good advice, right? If you, you've probably looked at this verse before, but if you think about what James just said, like it's brilliant from a communication standpoint. He gives us three commands, all three words. He says, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, for most of us, uh, you're just like, well, how do I put that on a t-shirt, right? I'm going to put it on a coffee mug or I'm going to Hobby Lobby because certainly it's there, right? Because that verse is really helpful advice. And we all love to go to scripture to get really helpful advice. And whenever I look at this, I got to tell you, it's one of the best. Like, that's really good advice. Consider these three things, the commands. How would your life be different if these three were reality in your life? Honestly, if you were the type of person that was quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, how would it change? And the thing that we oftentimes do is we start applying it to different areas of our life. So even just think about it from a marriage standpoint, right? From a marriage standpoint, how does this change everything in your marriage? Well, first you see quick to listen. Well, wives are elbowing their husbands, right? And then you see slow to speak. Well, husbands are elbowing their wives, right? <laughs> slow to become angry. If you have kids, you're both elbowing each other, right? Like if you just take the advice, this is great advice. Uh, this should really be helpful in our marriages to really be quick to listen, to slow to speak, slow to become angry. Certainly this would make sense. You think about it in work, you think about it in our life around, but I mean, let's just get really practical and really awkward if we're honest. 
Think about this reality in the year 2024 in an election cycle. Like, what if we applied these three things to our personal lives when it comes to the election this year? What if, just say, what if we were quick to listen? What if we were asking questions of clarity to truly understand before we chime in? What if instead of just hearing everything and yelling like everybody else is, what if we were quick to listen? And then, what if we were slow to speak? This does not mean that we don't speak. We are certainly called to speak. It just means that maybe we don't say or post everything that comes to our minds. What if not everything that comes to your mind is actually from Jesus? What if we were slow to anger? Good grief, friends. What if we didn't lose friendships over an election this year? What if we let the problems be the problems, not people? Isn't that crazy how you can just take good advice and kind of apply it all over your life and it makes total sense. On its own, it makes total sense. And if you kind of applied it in work and all those things, it works. But here's the deal. Any good Bible teacher and any good Bible student, um, it's the same when it comes to real estate. What's the most important thing? Location, location, location. What is the context of these three commands? If I take you back to last week, verse 18, here's what James says. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creations. So that is before this verse. Then you look at verse 21, which is after. It says, humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So these three commands that are three words that are great advice when you actually put it into context, what James is saying is when we approach the word of God, this is how we should approach it. So the actual meaning of the text of these three commands to us isn't necessarily good marriage advice or whenever whatever election's happening in the country. It's when you actually approach God's word, these are the three things we should consider. So as we approach God's word in your normal Bible reading plan or whatever it is, just one verse at a time, here's some things that we should do. Number one, we should be quick to listen. This makes total sense if you feel stuck. Get into the word and be quick to listen. Why? Because we need to hear so that we can understand what we don't know. God's word wants to tell us what we don't know, and we have to be very careful not to assume, friends, that we know everything. We have to be very careful that we're not coming in with our own bias to God's word. We want to be quick to listen. Friends, we are not experts on how God created the world. He is. We are his creation. And as creator, he tells us how the world works. We must be quick to listen. The question that I think all of us have to ask is, who or what are we listening to? Like who or what are we listening to? Maybe for some of you who feel stuck, it might be that you're not even in God's word, and that might be the issue right there, that we're not even listening to the word of God. Maybe you're stuck because you're so obsessed with the things of the world, and in so doing, your mind and your heart is becoming so consumed with it that that's why you're stuck. You're not even in God's word. We have to get in God's word and be quick to listen. Here's the problem. Our culture is so obsessed with noise. Like we are just not okay with quiet. We're not okay just to listen. And this is what uh, James is telling us when it comes to the word. Don't be obsessed with noise. Listen, be in the word, take some time, be quiet, still your heart and listen to what God has to say. However, if you're going to understand God's word, we must be slow or quick to listen. And second, we have to be slow to speak. This is probably the hardest one for all of us as it continues, because if we're slow to, or quick to listen, our slow to speak is not how we're hardwired. We're hardwired, you and I are hardwired to share our opinion about anything and everything. Um, and our culture platforms it. I think the Greek word for anger is Twitter, <laughs> right? So it's like, hey, let's give everybody a platform. No, not everybody needs a platform. We are to be slow to speak. You don't need to insert your opinion on what God says. The question is who talks to you more? That's the question I want to ask. God's word or your own thoughts? Like, here's the truth that I think all of us need to, to remember. 
Nobody talks to you more than you do. Unless if you have an eight-year-old daughter. <laughs> that girl can talk. But nobody talks to you more than you do. The issue with being quick to listen and slow to speak is we are hardwired to do the opposite. We want to be quick to speak and very slow to listen. It's actually celebrated in our culture. Now, here's the truth. I know this is going to get uncomfortable. We don't like to be quiet. And I think I know the reason why. It's because it's in the quiet that you have to come face to face with your own thoughts. And quite honestly, that scares us. Whenever we really see what's in our heart, whenever we really see what's there, that's what scares us. And that's why we try to fill our lives with noise. And so to be in God's word is to be quick to listen, slow to speak. You don't have to chime in. You don't have to say something too quickly. What James is saying is so counterintuitive. You'll need the spirit to show you and guide you. You'll need the spirit in your heart. That's why he's writing to believers, brothers and sisters. You have the spirit. You can be slow to speak and quick to listen. Now here's where it gets very real. Slow to anger. I mean, you know anger. I know anger. But have you ever considered this? Whenever we read God's word, you can be quick to anger. All of us. We're talking to believers. In our natural sinful state, the word of God will be at war with what you feel. What you feel will go at war with what the word of God says. It's why you can't always trust your feelings. Our feelings betray us all the time. So listen closely. You read this book and you'll become angry. I promise. It'll press in against you. It'll press against what you think. It'll press against what's in your heart. And when you're angry, you cannot listen. You know that, right? Like when you're so filled with rage and anger, you, have no, you don't have the ability to listen. When you're angry, you're quick to speak. You try to pop off as fast as you can. You'll want to push back. Your spirit will be incredibly offended. Now, let's have the real talk really quick. So what this looks like in our culture for us today I think you have two options when you look at what the Bible says. When you're reading the scriptures, you have two options. Number one, you can edit the Bible to say what you want it to say, which is what our culture has done. And there are books upon books upon books of people whose opinion is not, against the, who is not for the word of God, but they think they think you can make it say whatever you want it to say. Or you can let God change your life. We can edit the word of God, or we can let God change our life. When we are quick to speak... Slow to, slow to listen, quick to anger, we will want to edit the scriptures. Surely this is not what God meant. For sure this is not how he meant it to be. This is, uh, his ways of marriage and gender is kind of antiquated. Has he not progressed like the rest of us? We'll want to go edit the scriptures. We will try and make it say what we want it to say, not what God is actually saying. And this, friends, is why we must be slow to speak. And quick to listen. And this is quite honestly why we and so many in our culture feel so stuck. Because we're not letting the Bible read us. Now James says um, something interesting. He says, humbly receive the implanted word. And I have to ask the question of what does that mean? Receive the implanted word. Implanted means that it is in our hearts and our minds. That the word of God is in our hearts. The word of God is in our minds. Now, the good news, even if you're not reading the scriptures, like you're at a church who just preaches the Bible. So right now you're receiving the word. It's implanted as I'm speaking. So that's good news. So from here, our hearts and our minds should be, it's a big word, meditating on the words of God. We should meditate on God's word. And we oftentimes get, get meditation all wrong. Oftentimes we think it's to empty our minds of all things, which is Eastern thought. This is not what meditation is. The scripture tells us we don't empty our minds of everything. The scripture tells us we fill our minds with what? Truth. I thought you were going to jump in there. I got it. Truth. We are not supposed to empty our minds of everything. We are to fill our minds with truth. And when we fill our minds with truth, we're filling our minds with God's word. Here's what's interesting. Every one of us in this room knows exactly how to meditate. I promise. Like you do it all the time. Let me ask this question. Have you ever worried about something? Then you know how to meditate. If you've worried about something, it is just going all through your mind over and over and over. You can't stop. It's all you can think about. What you're doing is meditating. That's all it is. And so for us, as we're in the word of God, we're meditating. It's going through our minds. Have you ever replayed a conversation in your head or an argument after the fact? 
Like if I would have just said this, I'd be like, Gah! got them, right? You know how to meditate. That's what it is. It's going back to, okay, I learned this. I heard this in the word. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to, like, one of the things that's crazy is for us to kind of properly put ourselves in history for a little while. You do know that not everybody's had a Bible through all Christianity, right? Not everybody's had a, like, it's only in the last 300 years or so. So for 1,700 years before that, you know what they did? They went to church. The word of God was proclaimed. You know what they did for a week? They just thought about it. That was the word. I'm going to think about it. And that's what it is. It's just taking the word of God and thinking about it, wrestling with it. We take the good word of God, we think, ponder, and wrestle with it. So if you feel stuck, approach the word of God and think it like this. Quick, slow, slow. Just quick, slow, slow. Whatever it is, one verse, whole chapter, read the whole Bible. Just be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And honestly, friends, just see what the word does. See what God does in it. Okay, so that's his, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing he says, we receive the word. Now, what do we do? We, we're in the Bible. What do we do from here? Verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets the kind of person that he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. Okay, so we go to the word of God. We are quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. The word is implanted. It's in our hearts. It's in our minds. What do we do? This is where James, which he's classic for this, he's going to take everything we learned. He's going to turn it upside down on its head. And he's going to say, here's how you go from being stuck to unstuck. One of the greatest problems, I'm just going to tell you this, because I, I like to say this sometimes. I don't always make fun of the church, but sometimes y'all, we're pretty weird. Um, the church, one of the things that I see in the church today, especially that drives me crazy, is this. We are a culture who loves to appreciate good sermons, good podcasts, good books. Like we are the best at appreciating good content. We love to hear good sermons. We kind of send it to everybody. Hey, did you hear Chandler's sermon? Did you hear Greer? Did you hear Comer? Did you read that new book? Did you see the, hear the podcast on this? Like we start sending this to all of us and we try to start taking up as much information as we possibly can. Now hear me very clearly. Like I am very much for good sermons. I want there to be great sermons. But the question we have to ask is what makes a good sermon? Is it a golf illustration here and there? Certainly hope so, <laughs> right? Is it a couple of good jokes? I think it should be in there. But here's the problem. Sermons are meant to cause movement. Content that you're listening to, books that you're reading, sermons that you're absorbing are, are spent, or they are there so that there would be movement in your life. Let me help you because we get a little bit confused on this. Here's a slide I want you to see. Affirmation does not equal action. Affirmation does not equal action. Just because you agree does not mean you're acting on it. Like, I affirm that I should not eat carbs, but I'm not acting on it, right? It's January, maybe February. One of the things that I see is, especially in our cultures, we want to affirm good content, good orthodoxy, good doctrine, but we're not willing to do it. And there's a huge disconnect in our society that while you look the part, you're not living it out. That's what James is saying here. So affirmation does not equal action. The other thing I want you to consider is this. Technical understanding does not mean transformation. Technically understanding the, the truth of Scripture, it's important. It does not mean that your heart has been changed. So just to sit and absorb sermons does not mean your heart's changing. And that means it's not a good sermon. <laughs> We are called to be people who are not just hearers of the word. We are doers of the word. There is action invo involved here. You can affirm that you agree with what the Bible says, but applying that in your real life is something different altogether. This is where James gets very real. He's going to call you to the carpet. Are you doing what you believe? James uses a parable of a man in a mirror. It's a little confusing for me. I'm still a little bit confused, on, quite honestly. But here's what I think he's saying. 
The man does not look in the mirror to see himself as he really is and do nothing. That's what he's getting at here. The man who looks in the mirror, he sees himself as he really is, and then he walks away and does nothing with it. See, the truth is, what I do know, is mirrors don't lie. They're not lying to you. They don't lie to us. Mirrors simply show us reality, and that's the truth of what James is trying to get to with the Word. It's not going to lie to you. The Word of God will never lie to you. It won't sugarcoat anything, but it's not going to lie to you. If you don't simply read the Bible, friends, you let the Bible read you. When we're reading the scriptures, it's reading us. It's showing us who we are. And when we allow the Bible to read us, then all of a sudden we can clearly see what God has called us to, and it moves us to action. Be very careful. And I pray this is uh, for the bridge as well. May we not be a place that just loves good content, which I love good content. I pray that we'd be people who move with the content. The content goes from our head to our hearts to our hands. Because there is a lost and dying world who desperately needs the good news. And if all we're doing is just sitting back listening to sermons, we're missing the point. That's what James is trying to get to. It will require you to step out and do something. It'll certainly require faith, but be strong in the Lord. Be strong in who he is. When he calls us, he's certainly going to give us great content, but he's going to call us to do something. And then as you take one step after another, watch how the Lord blesses it. I've watched it in my own life. Just step forward in faith, see what he does. I'll be honest with you. Here's the truth. I don't think many of you need to go to another Bible study. I mean, like I love a good Bible study. I probably want to lead one one day, but you probably don't need to go to another Bible study. Here's what you need to do. Just do what you already know. Like love your neighbor. Love your spouse. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. And then all of a sudden, these two things working together would be shocked at what might happen in the world. It's not that you need more information. It's just needed you act on it. That's what we need to do. I don't mean to be harsh, but it's the Bible. So that's what I'm going with. Let's just keep moving. Let's just get started. You don't need to go to another Bible study. We'll offer some. Maybe some of you do. Now, let me be clear. Some of you have no understanding of how the scripture works. And that's when Bible study is awesome. Like jump in. You need to know the word. You need to be in the word. But if you're just comfortable, Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, but you don't do anything with it, friends, this is what James is saying. Don't do that. Okay. Verse 26. I've got eight minutes left. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. James isn't holding back, y'all, uh, so neither will I. Verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Here's how he ends the chapter one. It's pretty much in your face, but if you consider, okay, I'm gonna receive the word, I'm going to do the word, what James is giving to us here in verses 26 and 27. Here's the thermometer to see if that's happening. Here's kind of what I see. The thermometer is this, your tongue and your feet. You want to see if this is happening? You see if you're coming unstuck? You want to see if the word is being implanted and it's moving you? Then it'll be shown in your words and your actions, your tongue and your feet. If you want to see if you're growing, it will generally be found in your actions and your words. First, your words. Now, James is going to talk about this for a whole sermon in the, com in the coming weeks. But um, here's another cool uh, statement that I found on Google. Not really James, but here's what it was. God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. That's good, right? Your mouth is important. Your words are important. And what James is saying here is your mouth is a direct um, path to your heart. That if you want to see how your heart is, just listen to your words. If you want to see how your heart's doing, listen to your own words. You can't possibly have a pure heart and your words be filled with poison. A poisoned heart is shown in poisoned words. So all your mouth has to do is just show you what's in your heart. If the word of Christ is dwelling in you, your words will be growing in the fruit of the Spirit. Remember Galatians chapter 5. If our heart has been transformed in the word, we've received it, we're doing it, you will see your heart begin to change and you'll see it in your words. It'll be filled with love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You want to put a thermometer in your life to see if the word's doing the work? It'll first be in your words. Second, your feet. Notice the movement. Pursuing those who the world casts aside. Consider this just for a minute. In this time, if you were a widow, especially without male children or an orphan, you were out of luck. That's just the truth of this time. You were completely out of luck. People only cared for their own. That was a part of their culture. And one of the things that burst onto the scene with Christianity is we were not okay with that. It wasn't how Jesus lived. So what James is saying is so countercultural. Listen closely. Take care of people who could never take care of you in return. It's humility. It's when the word is implanted, you'll see it in my words and you'll see it in my actions. It's the whole point of, of next week's sermon. But care for people who can never take care of you. Ultimately, that the word has so changed our heart that we no longer think that we're the most important person. That's when we see true Christianity bleeding out from our veins. This is essentially the ministry of Jesus. And by focusing here, you will guard yourself against the trappings and the allurement of the world. That's where he's ending there. You can't focus on all the things of the world when our hearts are focused on what God has called us to focus on. That's how James ends the chapter. Um, I worked at a church because I only have four minutes left. I uh, worked at a church, my very first church uh, in San Antonio, and the pastor was awesome. Uh, still, great guy. Um, he's retired. He lives up in Colorado. But he would just do these really, he, he was really great at just his statements. Um, and whenever he would say just a sentence, it would always stick. Now, for me, I was a young kind of guy. I was kind of, you know, just wanted deep theology. But he kept saying this one thing, hey, read the Bible and do what it says. I was like, that's not deep enough right? Let's do a Bible study on that. Uh, now that I'm a little bit older, not much. He's right. Like, that's what James is saying here. Uh, we should read the scriptures and just do what it says. You don't have to parcel the Greek. You don't have to get into a big Bible study. Just read the Bible and do what it says. And I think we would be shocked at how not only our lives are no longer stuck, we begin moving in our walk with Christ, but you'd be shocked at how people around you will start walking with Christ as well. Read the Bible and do what it says. So you might be saying, what do I do? Read the Bible and do what it says. I think that's it. Um, as we conclude here, here's what I want you to do. Uh, there was a professor who was talking about James chapter one. He pulled out four T's. And so I want to say, okay, big picture as our, as we are growing in Christ, there's four T's that you find in James chapter one to kind of bring it all together. He said, you need these four things to go from stuck to being unstuck or from being stuck to unstuck for us to grow in our relationship with Christ. Number one is truth. James is saying, we need God's word shaping our minds and shaping our hearts. Be in the word. Just even if you're reading a verse at a time, I promise it will not return void. Just be in the word. You need truth. I need truth. Number two, he said touch, which is meaningful relationships and care. That you and I, as we're growing, especially in trials, we cannot be walking this alone. Now, certainly, you know, um, today we have Group Connect. If you do, if you're walking alone right now, no, you don't have to be. There's 18 groups out there who just get willing and able. It's like speed dating out there, something weird, right? Like you just walk up to a table, you find the right night that where it is you are, like Tuesday night's the best night for me. Well, there's a Tuesday night group back there. And just find a, a group. And there's, let me just tell you this really quick, because I've been doing this a little while. There is no perfect group, I promise you. Um, we're all a little bit messed up. But the point is get into a group and start growing together. But we need touch. We need meaningful relationships. Get in a group. Just start moving in your relationship with the Lord. We also, believe it or not, what James is telling us is we need tension. In our lives, pressure, suffering, difficulty, and trials, we actually need those in our lives, life to test us, to show us where we're growing. Don't be afraid when God tests you. Don't be afraid when he brings you through a trial every single person throughout the whole scriptures. We all go through this. He's making us more into his image. He's doing something in it. And then fourth, this is where I just want everybody to breathe. You need time. Our growth as believers does not happen in a microwave. It's just one step after another. It's just being in the word today. 
It's just taking a few notes. Lord, what do you have? Meditating on the word and then taking a step of faith, doing it. And then as you do it, I promise you'll see it in your words and I'll promise you'll see it as you start reaching other people around you. That's how it works. And that's what James is trying to say. All right. Now, for the remaining time, I want to always bring us back to be careful, especially with the book of James, not to start thinking that all of this is in our own power. You can't do this in your own power. You are not meant to do this in your own power. That's why we say, Holy Spirit, would you open my mind because only you are the one who's going to allow me to be slow to speak, to be quick to listen, slow to become angry. If you kind of walk out of here today and say, that's my, ne- that's my big three things, I'm going to go charge the hill, you're going to be seriously frustrated. But you pray those three things, watch how it happens. Spirit, would you open my mind and my heart that I might see? The reason this only happens is because it's the Holy Spirit in us. It's the life of a Christian. It's that Holy Spirit is in my heart, in my life. He's changing the way I see things. And the only way that's, ho- that's um, possible is through the gospel. And so every week we say the same thing, that Jesus Christ is the ultimate hope for every person. Though we are all sinful and our sin separates us from God, God made a way for us to be in right relationship with him again. That way is Jesus. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And God promises that all who place their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. That's the good news of the Bible. That's the good news for you today. So for those of you who are Christians in this room, the word for today is it's through Holy Spirit empowerment that this is possible. If you're not a believer in this room, this is not possible. The way it's possible is to invite Jesus into your heart, that he might save you, that he would reconcile you to the Father, and that's possible today for anyone who would put their faith and trust in Jesus. And that begins the process of growing more into the image of Jesus. It's available to anyone today.